you're running with the death to America crowd if you oppose this Iranian deal? Really? He's negotiating with the death to America crowd. He believes that somehow mullahs go quietly into the night, that they'll change their behavior. And the net result is the next president of the United States is going to be left with an uncertain world. Name a country in the world where our relationship is better today than it was the day that Barack Obama became president and Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. It's a question. <laughs> Cuba, Cuba and Iran. There's your answer. So name countries where our relationship is worse. How much time do we have? <laughs> Israel, Canada, our neighbor to the north. It's hard to do. Our largest trading partner, our closest friend, our strongest ally. Canada's re relationship has been ruptured in some ways. You go across the spectrum, and the United States now is no longer the leader. People don't know where we stand. And the net result is that we're living in a, in a world with less security rather than more. We need to restore a bipartisan consensus on foreign policy where we have peace through strength. And that means rebuilding the military rather than allowing the sequester to gut our military. That means providing support for veterans. In an all-volunteer army, there should be a, a contract, a covenant, if you will, that when you come home after service that you're going to get the kind of care that you deserve, that you earned. It means reforming the things that make it possible to create inside the Department of Defense so that we save money to invest in the best training, the best support for the greatest fighting force in the world. And it also means that we should never let our guard down in terms of our counterintelligence and intelligence capability to keep us safe. That, those two missions, a strong America, where our word is our bond, where people trust us again, and where our enemies fear us a bit, and high sustained economic growth, where we reform the things so people can achieve earned success, should be the mission for the next president of the United States. And it is my mission as a candidate to share my enthusiasm for this belief, and I humbly ask for your support and your vote. Thank you all very much. to the people in the back that can't come in because there's a there's a uh, fire marshal apparently it actually does count the number of people that come into places I haven't seen that in a while <laughs> doing his job but uh, sorry I'll make sure that we uh, we have a chat afterwards and if you want to yell a question you, you're first <laughs> all right yes sir we have a microphone so everybody can hear, and there's a one there too. Sure. Can I read the question for me? Yes. Thank you. Well, I can read it. Thank you. We welcome you. You can't stay here till February. <laughs> <laughs> vote absentee. I'm trying to get a vote here. <laughs> Here's what he says. Uh, thank you, Governor Bush. You have shared your views on several issues, such as jobs, education, immigration, and military. I have a question. I haven't gotten immigration yet, but we will. <laughs> our son Keith took ROTC program and field training for two years, but due to his deafness, he was asked to return his uniform back. Needless to say, he was devastated, but he is still fighting to return to school. With today's advanced technology, I'd like to know whether you'd support Americans with disabilities, including the deaf and hard of hearing, serving in the armed forces. Thank you. Thank you. Look, um, there, you're, you're, you're absolutely right that now, with assisted technologies, many people Excuse me. With assisted technologies, many people now uh, can do things that a generation ago they couldn't do. And whether or not people that are deaf or have other disabilities can serve in the military, I would leave up to the commanders as the, the first duty. We should not, I mean, there's a, there's a tendency now to take what's going on in society and kind of impose it on the military. Uh, rather than ask the military what's the optimum way to achieve the desired result. And one of the objectives, I think, for when I talk to military leadership is we need to maintain morale, 
We need to make sure that there's training. We need to make sure that the fighting force is done in a way that, that uh, protects them the greatest possible way. So in that context, given the fact that there's assisted technologies now that make it possible for people to do things that they couldn't have done before, you know, I think it ought to be considered for sure. But I wouldn't make that decision as the civilian commander in chief. I would seek out the best advice from the leadership of the military first. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Where are you going to live in Florida? Welcome. <laughs> well, let's, let's do a um, microphone. Governor Bush, you accepted $2 million in campaign funds from billionaire Richard Kinder of Kinder Morgan. Perhaps you're unfamiliar with the explosive safety record and the path of environmental disaster and health issues they leave behind. More than 17 towns in this region, including my own, are under the threat of Kinder Morgan's Northeast Direct Frack Gas Expressway through our towns for export <coughs> for New Hampshire. As president, you would be charged um, to reduce carbon emissions and would oversee FERC. Governor Bush, would you agree to give back that $2 million or pull for a no build on the Ned Pipeline? Neither. It's not my, it won't be my decision as president to make that decision. There should be significant local input. Natural gas right now is the lowest cheapest source of energy in the world, in the United States. And I think people in New Hampshire ought to make that decision. Do they want to have high utility prices or low? That's partially. FERC makes the call and so do local people. And so... Um, Barely. I'm the state legislature. We've got almost nothing to say about this. I'm just telling you that I know the process well. It's not going to be a federal, a, a Washington, D.C. process, a president's process process. But I think there ought to be more local input for these things. I, for one, would take the lower carbon uh, reduced energy source at a lower price to allow communities to be able to have uh, uh, sources of energy that allow them to create higher wage jobs and to have lower utility bills. But that's the decision that you all are going to have to make. Your family has a tremendous legacy when it comes to issues related to global development, uh, particularly President Bush's PEPFAR initiative. Uh, as a New Hampshire voter, I believe that regardless of where you're from, everybody deserves the opportunity to go to their full potential. Yep. Um, when we create partnerships to invest in kids, uh, we build the foundations for independent people and independent nations. If elected, uh, will you commit to launching a presidential initiative on early childhood development with a focus on nutrition and early education so kids in the poorest parts of the world cannot just survive, but thrive with bright futures for themselves and their country? You know, the, first of all, the PEPFAR uh, program is probably one of the great success stories of the last 20 years of the federal government, from a standing start to, uh, to spend money, invest money uh, over the long haul to, to get a huge result. A lot of time our foreign aid is just kind of there to take care of allies and we just send the money and we don't really know what the net result is. PEPFAR is the opposite of that. It's a, it's a model for any of the economic development and international development programs that exist because it's had a dramatic impact on reducing malaria and other diseases. And so that model that's more community based inside of countries rather than government to government is the proper one. As it relates to expanding um, aid programs, I'm not sure expanding it would be in, in the environment of $500 billion deficits as far as the eye can see. I'm not going to propose new money, but I do think we can shift money towards more effective ways at aid. And frankly, we need to work on early childhood development in our own country. You know, look, we have, back to education just for a brief moment, because that's that's one of the areas that I think is uh, essential is to assure that a child that gets to kindergarten can, can, has enough phonemic awareness and enough of the, the basic things that, that we take for granted, particularly in intact families, kids that come to kindergarten are significantly better prepared to learn than many children in our, in our society. So I'm a huge fan for early childhood education in our own country. Florida has 70% of its children in four-year-old programs in, in, the, in, the, in our state, which is more than anybody else. And we do it in a low-cost way. We do it in a way that, that uh, creates mostly, I think, 70, 80% of the, of the participants go to private, uh, go to faith-based, like church-based uh, programs and others. 
It's uh, and it's a it's a it's part of our constitution that every four year old has this right. And so I would rather just to be blunt about it. The focus in my mind ought to be first on these huge gaps, social development, uh, the, 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 the poverty that exists for, for young people. We have to contend with that here. 57% per, of, of children in Florida, in New Hampshire the number is growing, I don't know what it is, are, are qualified for free and reduced lunch, 57%. Uh, we're creating a different America if we don't contend with the fact that we're, we now have intergenerational poverty. And education to me, there's many other things that have to be done. Safe communities, we certainly have to have that. We need to make sure that the health issues are dealt with properly because a lot of times uh, kids, families in poverty don't have access to public health um, that, that they should. But education is the path out of this. And so early childhood development with a focus on literacy-based education to me is the proper role for our country to move forward as well. Yes, sir. I like those pants. I'm a little jealous. I'll tell you where I got them afterwards. Uh, but, Thank you. But, Thanks. Uh, I am uh, really thinking of uh, how important it is to be focused on only one thing next year, and that's a win. Not a good showing, but a win. Yeah. So, Not going to be in my resume. I, you know, nominee. <laughs> And when I think about some of the some of the issues that we've had in the party over the last couple of attempts at winning, one of the things that comes to mind is that the uh, the nominee is not necessarily made, in my mind, personally speaking, the best choice as a running mate. So when I think about that, I guess one of the questions I'd love to ask is, what do you think about as skill sets that you'd like to see to complement yours if you were to be nominated? The, the, I, I've not asked this question enough because this is an important decision. It's the first decision that a party nominee makes that's an indication of how you make decisions as president, right? And that's kind of, once you get to, get to the bottom line of this, it's a president is a decider. A president leads by making decisions. Many of them are tough. And so it's a, it's a great question to ask. And the first obvious criteria is that the person, he or she has to be qualified to be president. And that has to be apparent to people. It can't just be kind of something that you intuitively know. It has to be apparent for people because that's a, you know, people, people want to know that. They want to know that the person sitting behind the big desk can sit behind the big desk and that the vice president can do the same. The political side of this has historic, it's, you know, people always talk about, well, you got to have balance, you got to have, there's a question clearly about gender, depending on how the Democrats uh, move forward with their, their political process. That's a little up, upside down right now, it's hard to tell. But so, geography, gender, all those things, matching experience in some way, all those things matter, but they're really on the margins. I think the two things that matter are that the person be qualified to be president, that they are compatible, that, they're, that, that it works as a team. When you think about, historically, we've had vice presidents that haven't had great relationships with presidents, and it's kind of gotten ugly. Or you can think about relationships like Reagan and Bush, where it was, they, they worked well together. My dad uh, was an opponent of Ronald Reagan, but quickly he loved the guy, and they, he was loyal to him, and Ronald Reagan was extraordinarily loyal to my dad, and they did, they worked together in a way that was really helpful for our country. And so those two issues are the most uh, most important issues. On the questions of politics, there are other ways to deal with the, the how we win, because it's important. It's really important. We gotta win. And I think you win with a broader, you win when you campaign like this. You don't win when you're campaigning like this. You don't win when you're, when you're the large you know, dog in the room where it's all about you. You win when you connect with people about their aspirations, not about how you know, great you are, how rich you are, how this you are, how that you are. That's, that's not leadership. Leadership is connecting with people on what their aspirations are and giving them some hope that things can get better. And so a campaign should be about that as well. Yes, sir. We got, we got a microphone coming. Yeah. Sort of on the same point, um, when we, if you become the nominee, we have to persuade 
with some of the Democrats yeah, absolutely. Who for you. I mean, my brother is a Democrat, and he won't even eat bush beans anymore. Right? Well, that's good, what because is, there's what, a lot of sugar in those things. Yeah. And, <laughs> what is, I'll tell him about the paleo diet. Okay. In your opinion, what is the most legal... Uh, excuse most me, legal the, way of doing this? No, 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 no. The most liberal thoughts or expressions that you have that you think will pull in Democrats to say he's our man also. Look, I'm not a liberal. But you don't have to be a liberal to care about people. That's the point. That's the point. This is... I, I, I'll give the, the education story I tell because it's a story of, of people having to rise up. They got to rise up. 250,000 more people, more kids that were grade level <laughs> readers. You put that in the context of a decade, how important that is. How that gives someone a chance to actually go to college, give them a chance to actually get a job. That's what's important. What's important is to help people, irrespective of whether they're a liberal or a conservative or African American, Hispanic or white, none of that stuff matters in real service. What matters is that you have a heart for people, that you care about them, and that you can fix the things that make it harder for them to rise up. I'll tell you a story about Denisha Merriweather. She, is, uh, she took advantage of our corporate tax scholarship program in Florida. Denisha was in a, like, like many in our country, was family, was had a disruptive family life. Um, she was held back in third grade in Jacksonville, Florida twice. She was disruptive. She was angry. She didn't see purpose in her life. Can you imagine a young girl that age being held back twice because she just didn't, she didn't get it. She didn't get the, she didn't connect how this sitting around in a school mattered. And probably the traditional public school culture at the time really gave, sent that signal to her. So her grandma, heard about the Corporate Tax Scholarship Program, which is a program for low-income families to be able to take, go to a, a, a direct support organization through corporate tax scholarship, uh, corporate taxes, credits, that go into this fund, and she got into a private school. And within short order, she recouped the third grade losses that she had. And she was the first in her family. All started at the very beginning of my tenure when we fought this fight. It wasn't on behalf of you know, some think tank or anything like this. It was on this notion that I saw these children. I went to visit 250 schools. So the, question, the way you do this is you go campaign, listening to people, caring about them, connecting with them, and advancing causes that will help them. 250 schools is a lot of schools, don't you think? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty good day's effort. Well, I did, this, I did this over less than a year. I learned a lot. I learned how to communicate about why this stuff is important. And the Denishas of Florida are better off because I took on the entrenched interests. Now, I have never asked Denisha. She's the first in her family to graduate from, um, from high school in, she, uh, in her immediate family. And she's the first in her family to graduate from college. This young woman, beautiful young woman, articulate beyond belief, now lives a life of purpose and meaning. I've never asked her if she was a liberal or a conservative. Never going to, it doesn't matter to me. We win when we actually kind of put it in that human context and we campaign in a way that shows that we care about people. A lot of people are suffering right now. They're hurting and they see the government, they see the food fight they see the, I mean, they watch cable, it must be a disaster. I mean, think about watching, put on the lens of people that are one paycheck away from a really bad life or struggling with a disability in a family where their biggest fear is that they're gonna outlive, they're not gonna outlive their loved one. I know a ton of people in Florida uh, like that. Think about it from there. They're watching the political news and they're going, this is completely irrelevant to my life. It's funny maybe to see people saying all this stuff, you know, maybe there'll be a train wreck, it'll be fun to watch or whatever, but this isn't relevant to me. We have to make, for conservatives to win, we have to make it relevant for more and more people and we have to reach out to them with policies that are not liberal because the liberal policies have failed, with conservative policies reforming the things that are in the way. Yeah.
Do you believe that illegal immigration is a drag 